again, Biology 230. This is Dr. Chastity Bradford at Tuskegee University, and we are wrapping up Chapter 11, uh, our cell signaling chapter, cell communication. And hopefully this gives you the take-home message of this uh, last component of this chapter, which is cellular response. So if the ligand or the signaling molecule is epinephrine, depending on the type of cell that the epinephrine binds to, the receptor on that cell, uh, depending on the proteins within that cell that then are transducing or relaying that signal from the ligand, that dictates the response. So for example, when epinephrine binds to cells in the liver, it causes glycogen to break down. When epinephrine binds to cells within the heart or cardiac muscle, it causes contraction. The exact same signaling molecule, the exact same ligand, the exact same first messenger can then transduce a different signal and have a varied response. How does this all happen? If you recall, we have a first messenger and that's our signaling molecule. It will bind to its receptor depending on what cell it's in and then it will relay a signal through various signaling proteins. And then it will have some type of response. And once that response occurs, there's an inactivation of these activated enzymes. And oftentimes, phosphodiesterases will increase to keep the signal reduced or at bay. So cell signaling can lead to regulation of one or more cellular activities. One of them could be the breakdown of glycogen, and another response could be opening or closing of a channel. So there are different types of responses, and this is just two examples of cellular responses. It could be to break down glycogen, or it could be to open a, a channel. Or to... So... In this example, I am refreshing your memory on receptor tyrosine kinases. Of course, they're receptors that have tyrosine kinase residues, and these tyrosine kinases have to be fully active in order for them to uh, initiate and send some type of cellular response. Okay, So cell signaling leads to regulation of some type of often some type of cytoplasmic activities, or it could be some transcriptional activities. It can happen, uh, cell, cellular transduction, and then of course a response can occur, and that response again could be the opening of channels. In this instance, what we're seeing is that um, a signaling molecule is binding to uh, a gate, if you will. This ligand gated ion channel receptor um, will have a conformational change once the ligand binds. The conformation will change. This receptor will change shape. And what you're seeing here are ions that are coming into this cell and they're initiating some cellular response. Once that happens, they uh, Confirmation of this protein or this intracellular receptor changes and the gate closes and you notice that this ligand is no longer bound. So we this gate is going from a closed to an open state back to a closed state. So again, what you're seeing is um, different types of receptors are utilized uh, for different types of cellular responses. They could be um, in their different channels. These ion channel receptors can be ligand gated they can also be voltage gated. So I'm combining a lot of the topics that we've already used. And this is another example of a signal transduction pathway. And the response here um, is for uh, a transcription factor to um, be activated. And then we end up with some new protein as a result of this, this um, cell signaling that leads to regulation of transcription. So the response could be a number of things. Um, and 
It just depends on the cell type. It depends on the proteins that exist within these various cells, okay? Um, as well as the kinases that are there to um, transduce that signal. Uh, and in this example, I'm asking you what's the function of, um, of this here, which we would call a transcription factor. Uh, and so it just tells you what its function is in its name, okay? So we have a hormone receptor complex here that enters into the nucleus. And so cell signaling can lead to regulation, once again, of things that happen in the cytoplasm or things um, that happen within the nucleus. And, and this is an example of uh, cell signaling that leads to regulation of transcription. So the function of this hormone receptor complex that actually um, goes into the nucleus is to regulate transcription, and it does that, and functions as a transcription factor. So where do these things happen? Why do they happen? I just answered that question in the previous slide. These things can happen uh, in the nucleus. They can happen in the cytoplasm. Uh, what things am I talking about? I'm talking about cellular responses. That's what this 11.4 is all about, cellular responses. So a cell signal transduction pathway leads to regulation of one or more cellular activities. It could be opening a channel, closing a channel, um, as, I, as we illustrated earlier, and that response can occur in the cytoplasm or it can occur in the nucleus. And uh, another thing I wanted to highlight is that a lot of these signaling pathways, they're regulating the synthesis of an enzyme, or they can regulate uh, the synthesis of another protein. And they can do that by turning genes on or turning genes off in the nucleus, which is what we saw here. That um, this could be turning a gene on or it could be turning a gene off. So this is another type of cellular response. And this is um, in, in detail where you see a growth factor uh, binding to its receptor. So this component of the cell of the signal transduction or cell communication is reception. This receptor is then activated and it transduces its signal via a phosphorylation cascade. And remember, phosphorylation is just a transfer of a phosphate group from ATP to some protein. And kinases are usually involved in this transfer. And in this instance, what you're seeing is that this signal is then transduced and what happens is it causes the activation of a transcription factor. So you see that this transcription factor is now phosphorylated. And that this is the, uh, this elicits, elicits a response, okay, such that now it affects transcription, okay. Because now um, we may even uh, turn on or turn off some gene by this response here and that then will affect the mRNA that is then produced, and it then affects the protein that then is uh, translated, okay? So signaling pathways, they can regulate the activity of enzymes. So in addition to regulating the synthesis of enzymes, signaling pathways can regulate the activity of enzymes. And this is highlighting epinephrine again. So again, we have reception, transduction and response and by now you should understand this and really know it okay and there are elaborate pathways that exist and the purpose of all of these signaling pathways is to amplify remember amplify a response and they're also here because they specify the cell's response to the signals so we're amplifying a response as you see here at each step the response is amplified. Um, and in addition to amplifying a response, um, the, these pathways are contributing to the specificity of the response, okay? And so we have binding of epinephrine to its G protein coupled receptor. Uh, and remember these G protein coupled receptors have serine or threonine residue, residues, amino acid residues. Um, if it was a receptor tyrosine kinase receptor, uh, or receptor tyrosine kinase, I should say, of course it would have a tyrosine amino acid residue there, okay? Just a side note. Now, the binding of one molecule of epinephrine 
epinephrine transduces a signal, as you see here, you see the inactivation, um, an inactive G protein becoming active, and that producing a number of active G protein molecules, and then adenyl, adenylyl cyclase um, when it becomes active. Um, and remember, it converts ATP to cyclic AMP, and then cyclic AMP then activates protein kinase A. Protein kinase A can then activate phosphorylase kinase, which can activate glycogen phosphorylase, and glycogen phosphorylase can then promote the breakdown of glycogen to glucose 1-phosphate. So just one molecule of epinephrine had this major effect on signal transduction. And then this final response, which was um, the breakdown of glycogen, and it produced 10 to the 8 molecules of glucose 1 phosphate. So what you see here now is an elaborate pathway that amplified a signal, and there was a specific cellular response. This cell then um, broke down glycogen to glucose 1-phosphate. And if you recall in the very first slide, epinephrine can, can bind to its receptor and depending on the cell, it can have a varied response. So in this instance, um, the breakdown of glycogen occurs in the liver, but if this epinephrine bound to a receptor in the heart, it would cause the heart muscle to contract. And so various types of cells receive the same signal, but they can produce varied, varied responses. And how then does a cell fine tune its response? There are four aspects of fine tuning the response that you have to understand. There is amplification of the signal, okay? Just like an amplifier in a car, it makes the sound louder, okay? There's specificity of the response. This will fine tune it. You can then control that response. It's specific to the cell's type, specific to the proteins in that individual cell. Uh, the overall efficiency of a response can be enhanced by scaffolding proteins, and we're going to um, discuss that in the next slide. And we're also going to discuss how you terminate a signal. Another way of terminating a signal, we talked about phosphodiesterases and how they um, turn off the protein kinases um, by removing those phosphate groups, but there are other ways that we could terminate a signal. So these are all the ways by which we fine tune a response. Okay. Now, the specificity of a cell signaling and the coordination of that response is contingent upon a number of things. One, Different kinds of cells have different collections of proteins. So, of course, those cells then are going to coordinate a different response based on this, the proteins that are within that cell. And they're going to differ between cells. Um, these different proteins will allow cells to detect and respond to different signals. Even the same signal can have different effects in cells with different proteins and pathways. So, we have said this a number of times, so I'm sure you'll see it again. So, let's look at this. Um, using a pictorial diagram. So, uh, as we mentioned before, um, there is specificity and it's contingent upon the kinds of cells that are there and the collection of proteins in those cells. Okay, so a signal can trigger a single pathway in one cell, same signaling molecule, but now we have this re these relay molecules that are in this cell, and then you have some response. So some pathway leads to a single response. Now, you could have a the same signaling molecule binding to the same receptor, but now what is happening is your um, relay molecules are different. And so the pathways branch, okay? And now we're gonna end up with two different responses. So this branching of pathways and interactions between pathways, they're important. It's another way in which the cell can regulate its interactions. Okay? So in this example, we have crosstalk. So you have two different ligands binding to two different receptors. They have um, a signal transduction pathway that's elicited by uh, this receptor and via this receptor. But what you're seeing here is that when this this signaling molecule binds to this receptor, it then can activate or inhibit this other signaling pathway and then have some response. 
Okay, so the convergence of this communication between these two signaling cascades can have a response. So crosstalk occurs. So that's the, the take home message for this um, cell C is that in this cell, there is communication, there's crosstalk between two signaling pathways. Or you could have uh, a ligand binding to a different receptor and it's going to have a different response. Notice that the, the signaling molecules illustrated here are different. Okay. Now, in terms of signaling efficiency, how efficient some signal is, how efficient that signal is from the time that signal is received at that receptor till it responds, that efficiency can change and it can vary. What if you had to rely on diffusion for a signal to be sent from uh, the receptor all the way to some protein that caused a response. It would take much longer than if you put all of those relay molecules together. You package them all together. And that happens. So the packaging of all these relay molecules together is called scaffolding. Okay, So scaffolding proteins are large relay, relay proteins to which other relay proteins are attached. So that enhances the signaling efficiency okay and what they end up doing is increasing duh, the signal transduction efficiency by grouping together these different proteins involved in the same pathway for example we have a first messenger or this ligand binding to its receptor and we have a scaffolding protein here and this scaffolding protein is holding with it contained in the same area three different protein kinases so there is no need for diffusion everything that the cell needs is right here and so this enhances the efficiency of the signal so rather than relying on diffusion of these large relay molecules what you have here now is many signal pathways are linked together physically linked together by uh, scaffolding proteins now like everything, we have to have a system of checks and balances. We have to be able to uh, terminate the signal if necessary. And so there are inactivation mechanisms that are essential to cell signaling. So if a ligand concentration falls, then fewer receptors will be bound. That's one way that a signal can be, um, can be terminated. And so just as important as activating mechanisms are, inactivating mechanisms are also uh, important. And so in order for a cell to remain alert and have the ability just to respond to, you know, some incoming signal that's coming next, each change in, in the molecules that exist there in these signaling pathways, they, they, ha they last only very short periods of time. You know, they're very quick. So you have a ligand binding this is receptor, the receptor changing its conformation, and then, you know, it goes back, you know, to, no, to its normal shape so that it can then receive another signal. These things need to be able to happen quickly, fast, and efficiently. But what happens if some signaling pathway becomes locked into one state? Some component of the pathway is locked into the one state. Whether that state is active or inactive, what if all of these protein kinases, they're active, they're active, but then they get locked in this state. Then this cell remains in an activated state, and we cannot have that happen because um, the, the proper function of this cell would then be disrupted, okay? <clears throat> and so another thing to mention to you, I want to mention to you, is that this binding of these uh, signaling molecules to these receptors, they need to be reversible allowing these receptors to return to their inactive state when the signal is released. This needs to be reversible, and we need some inactivation mechanism or way to terminate these signals. And this is an example of how um, drug therapy is utilized in cancer, and this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, uh, the month of October. And so we're going to illustrate to you here how Receptor tyrosine kinases are utilized in uh, tumor proliferation and how drugs have been designed based on this uh, biology of receptor tyrosine kinases to terminate a signal. So in this example, HER2, 
you might have heard about it, um, is human epidermal growth factor receptor 2. Now, HER2. So you may hear um, about women who may be HER2 positive, which means that they have um, this human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 there. Um, uh, in their breast cancer. The breast cancer, those tumor cells possess this receptor. They have this receptor. Now, this receptor is a receptor tyrosine kinase. Now, remember, they had to come together and dimerize in order to send the signal, which is um, demonstrated by these little uh, circles here. Ding, 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 ding. So it's like, okay. These receptor tyrosine kinases have dimerized or they've come together, and now this cell will proliferate. In other words, it will just multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. That's what tumor cells do. They just grow and they divide and they divide and that's what the signal is, okay? Now, drugs have been designed that will bind to um, part of this uh, receptor tyrosine kinase so that they can't combine and dimerize like they normally do. So normally these receptors come together and they dimerize, right? And they're fully active. But herpes, Herceptin is a uh, approved therapy for breast cancer. And what it does is it blocks this downstream signaling. So it binds to one of these receptor tyrosine kinases. So when it does that, the dimerization cannot occur. And therefore, the proliferation that normally occurs when these uh, receptor tyrosine kinases dimerize, that is inhibited or prevented. Okay? So this is one mechanism by which um, drug therapies have been designed based on the biology uh, and what we know in, about receptor tyrosine kinases. And this is how the signal for proliferation is terminated. Now, the last component of this is apoptosis. So this is another way um, to terminate a signal or another way that our cells actually signal. So apoptosis integrates a lot of cell signaling pathways. What is apoptosis? I love that word, apoptosis. Sounds like something's popping, right? So apoptosis is programmed or controlled cell death. It's programmed or controlled cell death. So again, it's another way in which our cell regulates something and it regulates and it controls whether or not a cell will live or will it die. Okay. There are components of the cell that are, that are um, broken down and packaged into vesicles that are digested by scavenger cells. And we talked about that in previous chapters and the role of these lysosomes, um, which of course were our so-called garbage trucks of the cell. But in addition to that, apoptosis prevents enzymes from leaking out of a dying cell. If you have a cell that's dying and there are um, enzymes inside of that cell that will then leak out. Those enzymes could damage the neighboring cells. So apoptosis, not only is it programmed cell death, but in that programming, although the cell is dying, apoptosis prevents those enzymes that are in that cell from leaking out and damaging neighboring cells. Our body, the physiology of our system is so dynamic. And so what we have here is this is a normal cell. This is your cell undergoing apoptosis. Any questions? Apopto apoptotic pathways and the signals that trigger them uh, often involve caspases. Okay? Just a name I want to throw out there. Aces lets you know it's an enzyme. Caspases, they're the main proteases or enzymes that cut up proteins. Proteases. So caspases are proteases. They're, they are enzymes that break down proteins. So they're the main proteases that carry out apoptosis. How can it be triggered? We don't want to just have apoptosis all willy-nilly. We want it to be controlled. So what triggers apoptosis? There could be some extracellular death signaling ligand that says, okay, it binds to the cell and then says, okay, this cell is then programmed to die. Uh, there could be a damage in the nucleus, DNA damage in the nucleus, and that triggers apoptosis so that then we're not replicating damaged DNA. And there could be misfolding in the um, protein misfolding in the endoplasmic reticulum. And that could 
trigger apoptosis. So you can see how, how dynamic this system is and how essential it is for the development and the maintenance of all animals. So know this, understand this is the so what of apoptosis. The so what is that it's essential for life, for how we develop and how um how our systems are maintained because if things are are being degraded and um, cells are being damaged, then we need to get rid of it and that's maintenance, okay? Uh, apoptosis can be triggered by an extracellular death signaling ligand. That was one way, right, in which we can trigger apoptosis. So if this is a, um, a cell that has no death si signal, what you're seeing is a receptor here and this is a um, transmembrane receptor. You're noticing that um, this is said said nine here in red, and it's active. And when it's active, said four and said three are inactive. Okay. Now, when this death signaling molecule or ligand binds to its receptor, said nine then becomes inactive. Now, when said nine is inactive, said four and said three then become active. This um, signaling cascade causes the production of proteases and nucleases. And remember, proteases are responsible for degrading proteins. Nucleases degrade, um, the, can degrade the nucleus. So if there is some signal where DNA is damaged or some uh, protein is damaged and it needs to be degraded, uh, this is what will happen. So you notice here that under normal conditions, the cell is round. But then when it starts, the trigger apoptosis is triggered, this cell forms blebs. So it begins to look like this. Okay, so this is what it really looks like under a microscope. And this is the pictorial diagram of a death signal. Okay, now, one of the other things that apoptosis is important for is just development of animals. And so what you see here is um, an interdigital tissue. And then these cells in between the digits undergoing apoptosis are cell death, okay? Programmed cell death. And so now, over time, you begin to see the individual digits. This happens in us. So as you're born, in between, when you're in your mother's womb, in between your fingers, in between your toes, is programmed cell death, okay? If not, you end up with webbed feet webbed fingers just like um, Ashton Kutcher. As you see here in his mom's tummy, this programmed apoptosis did not occur for whatever reason. And because it didn't occur here, um, he has webbed feet and a lot of people have it. As he says here, it's actually more common than you think. And so um, what I hope you gain from this is the, the fact that um, we have Reception, transduction, and response. And in terms of reception, some first messenger or signaling molecule is binding to its receptors. These receptors can be different types of receptors. They can be G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, um, They can be tyrosine kinases. Uh, and so... And they can have different amino acid residues depending on the type of receptor they are. Now, once that ligand binds to the receptor, there is a signal that is transduced. So in terms of signaling transduction, there are a number of uh, proteins, enzymes that are involved in, in this relay of the signal from an extracellular signal to some type of uh, response. And kinases are often involved because they're involved in phosphorylation, but there is some regulation so there has to be a balance between phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. And so you often have uh, protein phosphatases that are involved in dephosphorylation. Uh, in addition to this transduction mechanism, there are second messengers. There are, there's calcium, remember that. There's cyclic AMP that is the second messenger, diazole glycerol. Um, IP3, all of these fall into the category of second messengers. Make sure you know this. And then in addition to all of that information that you've learned, um, once the signal is transduced, it causes the cell to respond in a, a certain way. Now this cellular response can be cytoplasmic. It can happen in the cytoplasm. This response can happen in the nucleus and it can affect transcription. Um, and so we can change 
a number of things, channels. This response could be the opening or closing of a channel. It could be a change in cellular metabolism. Uh, for a lot of the examples we gave in terms of um, the fact that epinephrine can bind to its receptor. And depending on the type of cell that epinephrine um, binds to, that dictates the response that uh, will occur. So if epinephrine binds to a cell in the liver, it will call glycogen, cause glycogen to break down, right? Because you recall the glycogen phosphorylase will be activated. Glycogen will break down. But if epinephrine triggers the cardiac muscle or the heart, if this happens to the if it binds to receptor in the heart, the cells in the heart will contract and your heart will beat faster. So the specificity of the response changes based on the type of cell that's there and the signal transduction that is relayed is dictated by the type of relay molecules that exist there. And in terms of this relay, this of course can occur in a way that is branched. There could be crosstalk in the signaling and the efficiency could change if we increased our created scaffolding proteins or had um, scaffolding proteins there that linked that physically linked relay molecules um, with other signaling molecules okay and so it's just important to know that we also have uh, mechanisms of activating these systems and we have mechanism of inactivating these systems these signaling cascades and I really want you guys to um, understand cell communication and understand the role of apoptosis because it's crucial and essential for animal survival.